visible and, and hearable by everybody. So good morning, everybody. I see that there's already quite a large bunch of people uh, among the attendees. Uh, of course, I'm glad of it. Uh, so uh, we are really pleased to host uh, Professor Elisa Giuliani today for our webinar series named Research Does Not Stop. Uh, Elisa is, is, is a friend of us, but for those uh, who do not know her yet, let me briefly remind you that Elisa Giuliani is Professor of Environmental Economics Management of the University of, of Pisa and importantly is director of the REMARC Center, which is a, a resp responsible management research center, which is quite interesting research center, which does a lot of interesting activities. Um, she has a terrific uh, experience of, of researcher, uh, really uh, a number of, of, of very good papers in, in, in outstanding journals. Uh, she's editor for research policy and she's in the boards of a number of a journal, uh, areas of expertise, expertise in general, spans from, from innovation to economic development, and, uh, and she has a, a, a special focus on, on responsible management, uh, business and human rights. And, and to <coughs> an extent, I think that the presentation she's gonna deliver today is related to these last uh, topics. Uh, having said this, uh, sorry, a few words to present yourself. Let, let me remind you and to everybody uh, the rules of the game. So Elisa will have uh, most one hour time for presenting her paper. If uh, there are sort of a spotlight instantaneous questions from the attendees, uh, I'm, I'm gonna collect them in the chat on the on DNR. Um, I'm gonna take care of that and, and in case uh, I will uh, stop Elisa and, and ask her to reply, providing these are really instantaneous and spotlight questions. We don't really want to interrupt the flow of a discussion, okay? Uh, after a one hour time, then we were gonna have a, you know, more relaxed discussions um, for Mark, oh, there's Simona also there, Ciao Simona, uh, for another extra hour of time. Uh, and as usual, uh, those who want to uh, intervene, comment, and, and ask questions uh, can either uh, raise their hands or, or, or write uh, something in, in the chat that I'm going to pick up, okay? Uh, one important thing is that we are, simul we, we are recording uh, the webinar uh, so that if, if some of the attendees uh, is, is against that, I can be asking to air to, to leave the webinar and in case follow the webinar uh, in our YouTube channel, uh, given that we are, we are broadcasting the webinar on the YouTube. Uh, we have Chiara Burlina, our postdoc taking care of the YouTube. So if there are the questions from there, uh, we're gonna pick up questions from there too, okay? So I think that uh, I've said everything and I'm gonna, gonna steal far the time to the discussion. So. Elisa, thank you very much for having accepted our invitation and the virtual floor is yours. Okay, so thank you everybody also for inviting me and for the very nice introduction. Um, I'm presenting a paper that starts with living in a poisonous uh, world. Uh, so I hope it's, I'm not going to be too dystopian. Um, and uh, especially this, uh, during these hard times. Uh, but this uh, is a research project uh, that is uh, involving different people in this particular, and mainly I would say, Ariana Martinelli and Gianluca Biggi who are attending the seminar today, who really are the, um, my resourceful uh, collaborators. Uh, and, uh, and I thank them for, for that. So uh, let me just start by saying a couple of things about today, today's talk. Uh, as you see from the title, I'm going to look at pesticides inventions, inventions around pesticides, and uh, look at the temporal geography of these inventions. And one of the reasons why I focus on these inventions is that there is growing awareness about the fact that innovation has a dark side. There is a 
quite interesting uh, special issue by Alex Code and colleagues uh, in uh, uh, um, uh, industry and innovation this year, and basically pointing at the fact that innovations uh, uh, can have a dark side that have um, that has uh, been uh, uh, perhaps overlooked. Some of them have. have perhaps been overlooked. Um, and, and this is a special moment for addressing these issues because there is growing uh, sensitivity towards uh, uh, unsustainability, uh, towards the promotion of sustainability. And these issues uh, of social and environmental sustainability are high in many agendas at the government as well as supranational levels. Also, I have to say that this paper is really the outcome, uh, I mean, was prompted by uh, one uh, special session that I organized with Simona that I see here at the GEO Indo conference in 2020, when we uh, actually uh, could, was the, the last minute before the COVID outbreak. And uh, uh, which we organize on the dark side of innovation. And I think that's uh, sparked a lot of thinking and perhaps a new agenda on uh, the dark side of innovation within uh, regional studies in economic geography. I consider uh, pesticides as dark innovations, and I define that, uh, we define that as. Uh, innovations that possess intrinsic features that can be potentially harmful for humans and the ecosystems. Now, before I go into the presentation and just following up on what, on what uh, um, um, Sandro was saying, let me just clarify how this work positioned in my own research agenda. Uh, basically, as you probably, some of you might have uh, known my work before today, but many probably hasn't, haven't. So I, I start, uh, uh, in my early career, I started working on innovation and technological catching up of developing countries. I've worked uh, a lot on uh, industrial clusters, uh, global value chains, and multinational enterprises with the idea of understanding how the private sector can help uh, development processes, especially, especially in, the, in the less developed countries. And then over the last 10 years or so, I have also started to look at how the private sector has broader societal uh, impacts. Uh, and so, uh, of course, the issue of international business and human rights and CSR, as well as the broader issues on, on uh, responsible capitalism are a very central uh, topics and they are also uh, one part of my research agenda. So this paper today uh, is, is instead, uh, as, as rightly my, uh, Sandro picked up, uh, a sort of uh, combination or integration between these two uh, agendas that uh, have uh, for some time uh, gone in parallel. Uh, and, and so it's looking at innovation, but also by by trying to understand how firms sometimes can, through their innovation, harm human rights, like the right to health, or through the uh, debt damaging of uh, the, their ecosystems. So that's uh, what this uh, paper is about. I mean, did, that's how I situate uh, this paper today uh, in the agenda. So uh, the motivation for this study comes from the idea that we are all now uh, worried about environmental challenges, grand challenges and environmental uh, grand uh, problems. We talk in these days a lot about climate change uh, and, and rightly so. We also talk a lot, a lot about uh, uh, circular economy and recycling of waste and so on. So clearly these are core topics uh, about which we hear, uh, I would say daily. But there is another element uh, that has to do with environmental grand challenges, that is the environmental toxicity um, dimension that is more perhaps of a silent threat, but it's, it's a very important one, sometimes uh, uh, not much uh, fashionable as the other two, but clearly uh, central, um, as I will uh, elaborate uh, in a little while. Why is it a problem? Well, first of all, because we are all exposed to, to chemicals and to toxic chemicals. Some of this exposure comes from uh, past, from the past, from chemicals that have been banned uh, in many countries worldwide and we no longer use them, uh, but uh, have bioaccumulated. So they are still in the environment. They are in the fat of our bodies. And so 
we still have to face, especially people of my age or older uh, ages have still to uh, face that particular threat. But also we are continuously exposed in new, uh, to new chemicals because clearly the chemical industry is, uh, is inventing new things every day. And uh, we are exposed through different channels, through what we eat, the air we breathe, uh, the clothes we wear and so on. More worryingly, we are exposed to the so-called chemical mixtures. That means that whereas we, so that means that we are exposed to many different chemicals at the same time. And whereas we know how one individual chemical affects our health, we don't know much. I mean, the, the chemists don't know much. And this is what the, this uh, science, very recent science article is about on the right. Uh, uh, how we react to, to multiple exposure to different chemicals, uh, because the interference and the, uh, and the uh, general effect on our health of different chemicals is not well known. So this constitutes uh, clearly an issue of concern. Uh, in, in, moreover, uh, we have growing evidence of the fact that uh, exposure, even at low doses, to uh, chemicals has been uh, um, uh, one of the causes or is potentially one of the most important causes of the emergence of many of our contemporary illnesses, including uh, uh, cancers and uh, um, forms of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer and uh, uh, illnesses concerning uh, endocrine regulation. And besides that, they have important effects on the ecosystems. But also, it's not just about the broader societal impact, it's also about the fact that firms are realizing progressively no, more now that uh, uh, toxicity and growing toxicity of the chemicals that they produce or use is, uh, is becoming a big liability. Uh, probably you have heard uh, about the glyphosate case uh, and the fact that into the glyphosate is a well-known herbicide uh, that uh, was uh, produced and is produced by Monsanto. Monsanto has been acquired in 2018 by Bayer. And in 2015, it has been classified by the WHO IARC as probably carcinogenic. And though clearly uh, raising the alarms uh, around this uh, toxic, uh, this chemical, uh, which is nevertheless today still allowed uh, in many countries in the world. Now, clearly, um, because, of being, uh, because of its alleged toxicity, there have been a record level of lawsuits of uh, uh, these uh, uh, of users of uh, glyphosate and uh, using the commercial name of the product is known as Roundup. Um, that have uh, fallen sick of uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And as a consequence of that, uh, eventually buyers, buyer decided to offer a two billion uh, bail, basically to settle all future uh, roundup lawsuits, especially because uh, uh, the early lawsuits were um, million dollar lawsuits that the plaintiffs uh, won. So clearly it's not just a matter of how we members of society are impacted by these chemicals, but also there is increasing awareness of the business sector that this is going to become a very material uh, issue. And, uh, um, and the informal conversations with experts in the field has uh, revealed how companies in other industries than chemicals, including the textile industry, as well as the cosmetics industry, are increasingly more and more worried about uh, claims of uh, and accusations of toxicity of their own products. And of course, uh, as with uh, uh, um, with all the issues that have been left un unattended for many years, uh, it still uh, it becomes a big policy issue, a big policy uh, topic. Uh, as I said, it's not as big as the climate change one, but clearly it uh, takes uh, it has a role. It, it's uh, sorry, oops. It's, um, um, it's part of, you probably have uh, scanned or read carefully, read carefully the EU uh, Green Deal uh, of 2020, and you've uh, seen uh, perhaps that uh, one of the key pillars is the promotion of a toxic free environment. Uh, where uh, the, uh, as you see here, the, uh, one of the goals is to avoid, uh, um, uh, sorry, how can I minimize the, okay. Okay, good. Uh, one of the goals. I'm afraid that we have, we have lost you, Elisa. 
Well, one of the objectives of the EU Green, EU Green Deal is to achieve a toxic free environment and particularly uh, is uh, uh, that type of goal is oriented at avoiding harm to the planet and the future uh, generations and the current and future generations. So thinking about a chemical uh, industry and a chemical products where these uh, uh, the new inventions are uh, less toxic over time. Now, clearly, these are important policy claims, and it's clear and it's important that the EU, as well as the UN uh, uh, Development Goals, acknowledge the importance of addressing this pending uh, problem. Uh, but at the same time, we are seeing that this problem is continuing uh, uh, almost unperturbed. Uh, the uh, the Faustat data show how the pesticides uh, use worldwide has increased quite heavily over the last 30 years. Uh, um, as you see also on the right hand side, the, the figure on the, on the planet shows that uh, uh, this is uh, the pesticide uh, use per area of cropland, uh, uh, showing that pesticides are also intensively used, uh, uh, not just in, uh, in, uh, in China or in developing countries, but also in Europe, for instance. And so clearly this is not a problem that has to do entirely with uh, the poorer countries, but also it's a central problem to many other uh, high income countries. Now, um, we have this policy attention. We have the evidence that use of pesticides is growing. But I mean, at the same time, uh, we have, we are acting, it looks like we are acting at, uh, very late as compared to when we were initially warned about the perils of pesticides. So um, the early evidence of bioaccumulation properties that, as I said before, are one of those properties that are particularly dangerous because that are related to the fact that these toxic chemicals are not biodegrading in the environment and in the human bodies were already available in the 1930s when DDT was sprayed massively against malaria in Sweden and Italy. And so we have uh, already since uh, the uh, early stages of the last century warnings and warning signals that this, uh, this is an industry that has problems. And um, certainly the most influential milestone of this uh, uh, growing awareness of the dangers of pesticides is uh, Rachel Carson's uh, 1962 book, Silent Spring. Uh, she was uh, perhaps the first uh, women, woman um, to engage in uh, uh, environmental sciences. She didn't have a PhD for, uh, I think that was gender reasons, uh, uh, but uh, certainly she compiled a very meticulous uh, uh, um, research and uh, which resulted in this book, um, documenting the effects of a, a set of uh, pesticides being used uh, heavily during the 50s in uh, the US agriculture uh, uh, and how these uh, pesticides were affecting uh, um, um, living species and particularly the environment, birds and so on. So the silent spring refers to the fact that as compared to when she was young, in the later, uh, when, when the pesticide became more um, spread over the crop fields, uh, she could no longer see here in the, in the spring, the birds singing. And she focuses on a highly, on a class of highly hazardous pesticides, which are known as persistent organic pollutants, because they possess three features. They are uh, toxic, but they're also not uh, easily biodegradable, so they persist in the environment and also they travel long distances, so they can also be found in places where they have never been used. She has been very influential in uh, pushing for uh, the rise of environmental movements in the US first and then globally. And also she has prompted the first regulatory steps in the, in the US, for instance, the Environmental Protection Agency was set up in the 70s and so on internationally. Clearly, if I have just to focus, POPs are a special class of the whole uh, the IPC class of, of pesticides, and I will, uh, I will elaborate in a second. But what is important here is that, um, that I would like to emphasize before I really go into more the, the details of our analysis, is that uh, 
even when we know that something is harmful and there is uh, initial evidence uh, that something is, uh, is causing uh, concerns for, for humans and for the ecosystems, it may take many, many years before we finally get to first scientific evidence, to more solid and systematic evidence, and we bring that evidence on the desk of policymakers to make the change in terms of regulations. And so, for instance, in the case of the persistent organic pollutants, which are really the most dangerous hazardous chemicals uh, ever classified, it took nearly 40 years since the early evidence, which I would you know, uh, co make correspond to the early 60s when, when the book uh, by Rachel Carson came out, uh, to, um, um, since her book, to the uh, uh, signing of the so-called Stockholm Convention, which is uh, um, an international uh, treaty, uh, of course, promoted by the UN, uh, that uh, bans and regulate and restrict uh, the use of many of the, pop, uh, of the persistent organic pollutants. And it also establishes a committee that uh, assesses on a, on a continuous basis the emergence of new POPs and therefore make uh, suggestions for banning to countries. So it really, it really shows uh, this, you know, this graph shows, even if it's a specific case on, on the POPs, that it takes many years for, for really the, the scientific evidence to get to uh, policy action. We know that on, 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 other, on other domains as well. But that's, that means that in the time that it takes for regulators to act, these substances are still in use in many parts of the world and still are affecting human uh, lives. Of course, regulations have progressed over time. There are international treaties, not just the Stockholm Convention, but also the Rotterdam Convention, which focuses more on trade. There are national norms. Uh, and as you can see from the right, uh, from this graph on the right, uh, countries may take uh, uh, action even before international treaties uh, to regulate certain uh, toxic chemicals. This is the case, for instance, for, for DDT, but we did the same uh, graphs for many others, persistent organic pollutants. And it's clear that some countries act very early stage, other countries are much more lazy. Uh, and it, it, it may take many, many years before they take action. Uh, as you can see here, the blue one are those countries that have restricted uh, DDT uh, or prohibited DDT uh, in, uh, over time. Uh, the, the, the red one are those that have only partial, uh, pa partial national bans, whereas the green ones are the countries that have ratified uh, the years in which they have ratified the Stockholm Convention. And by ratification, it means that they will, they take, uh, um, they, com they commit to take action at the national level. Of course, the, 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 the reason why these regulations are very slow and very imperfect uh, is, is well known by, for instance, uh, uh, research on uh, uh, STS studies, which shows how, in fact, the chemical industry sometimes is very um, aggressive in, in terms of lobbying uh, uh, to slow down regulations that can affect their business. And we probably know here are some quotes that I think are very informative, but we probably know that also from anecdotal evidence. In other cases, it's just that uh, collecting uh, uh, sound scientific evidence can be tricky. Also, there's another issue with the, that is specific to this industry, um, and, uh, um, and that it's important, is the fact that currently authorization processes of given uh, substances rely on evidence and scientific research being conducted by the industry itself. So a firm has to uh, conduct uh, using uh, good laboratory practices research showing that a given substance is not toxic and then the authorities uh, just look at the evidence is what is happening now with the vaccines as far as I can understand I'm not an expert but basically it's it's the industry that provides the laboratory studies and then the authorities that assess whether this uh, this criteria this research is well conducted or not. So what are these, against this background of imperfect regulation, very important salient issue, and also growing in policy attention on this subject, what is this paper uh, goal? So the first thing that we, we try to do is uh, by focusing on international 
uh, patent class IPC uh, class of pesticides over the period 1990-2017, and also on the subclass of persistent organic pollutants, which is uh, the whole list, as I would say, uh, of 27 chemicals. 28 chemicals, we uh, looked at whether, um, first of all, uh, which are the top patenting countries and regions, and how these uh, geography of inventions have changed over time. And then by taking only the two top regions worldwide for pesticide inventions, we compare the toxicity of these uh, chemical compounds that get patented. And, and that's uh, something that I will explain methodologically now. So the first part, as I said, is the temporal geography. So inventors, uh, geolocalization is key. And so to do so, we, we did uh, uh, actually have to say, Ariana did the match between uh, the, an initial set of 93,000 pesticides uh, belonging to the IPC classes, uh, manufacturer of pesticides and other, other agrochemical products uh, um, and uh, uh, from the Dervent uh, chemistry resource database. And she matched that with the Rustin Foss uh, um, data set uh, in order to localize, to geolocalize the inventors of our patents. And that gave us uh, uh, some 37,000 uh, patent families between 1990 and 2017. And uh, then we also select a subset of uh, pop inventions, that is inventions that in the patent claim include one of the 28, uh, one or more of the 28 highly hazardous pesticides that have been uh, uh, included in the list of the Co Stockholm Convention that I mentioned before, and that gave us uh, 519 patent families over the period. And as you can see, the graph uh, on uh, uh, the right, there has been an increase of both type of patents over time, although, of course, uh, the scale is different. Uh, and on the right, you have the number of, of pop patents, and on the left, you have the number of uh, overall pesticide families. So as I said before, uh, we also run a toxicity analysis. Now, toxicity analysis is very time consuming. So we could not perform that on the whole set. Uh, it would take months. Um, and so we have restricted that to a sample uh, by taking the, the patents of uh, uh, the uh, regions that are more intensively uh, patenting um, uh, worldwide. And so this uh, methodology that we, we use for assessing toxicity draws on uh, the collaboration with chemists and toxicologists. So we did not enter this field uh, alone. Actually, we have a paper uh, also with uh, one toxicology, Emilio Benfinati from Instituto Barrio Negri that is under review. And a version of this paper is uh, also available as a, as a lab working paper where we explain uh, this methodology with some examples. And uh, uh, so basically this toxicity analysis is made of three steps. Step one is uh, trying to connect a patent to uh, um, chemical uh, structures or chemical compounds. So in the chemical industry, probably you know that uh, firms try to block patent drivers uh, from patenting uh, their, in, in their market, from patent or en entering in their markets through uh, the so-called uh, Marcus claim, which is uh, something that you see uh, uh, depicted on the right. And it's a way of describing multiple different chemical constructions to achieve uh, the same or a comparable uh, function. And so the claim section of the patent is where uh, uh, the patent protection is sought. And that's, that comes from earlier research on, uh, um, on the chemical, uh, on chemical inventions. And so we look at, the patents uh, and specifically at the patent claims, and we look at uh, uh, the uh, toxicity of the chemical compounds that are included in the patent claim. And to do so, we need to match uh, the names of these uh, uh, that are included in these patents on the right hand side here with each of them, which each individual uh, uh, chemical structure, uh, each of them, uh, each chemical structure has uh, a unique uh, international identifier. Um, and this is a tedious, very laborious work that I think uh, Gianluca needs to be acknowledged uh, about. And um, because clearly in a, in a patent claim, there can be tens, dozens, or even hundreds of different chemical compounds. 
So what we do, this is an example. So this is caffeine, this is this caffeine uh, compound structure, and these are different uh, uh, international identifiers. They are alternatives. Some uh, systems use uh, uh, the first one, others use the second, but basically they are uh, unique identifiers for that particular uh, structure, chemical structure. So that means that if you have a patent, you need to go from the patent to the chemicals. Uh, and that's absolutely necessary if we want to see the level of toxicity of the chemicals that are included in the patent claim. Now, toxicity is a field in itself. And as again, we work here and we have, uh, it's almost serendipitous the way we started working on this project, but I will leave it for the Q&A if you're interested. Um, so, the, the, of course, toxicity can be uh, tested and is actually tested in different ways in vivo and in vitro, it means you use animals or uh, cells and bi biologic materials in laboratory, but there is an increasing uh, use uh, of in silico methodology or in silico toxicology, which are basically computational methods to assess or predict potential toxicity of a given chemical compound. Um, this is widely used uh, as a, as a first screening of some of the uh, chemical compounds. It's used now more to avoid uh, on certain type of, uh, of assessments to avoid use of animals and vertebrates because this has posed uh, uh, huge uh, ethical issues. And it's a technology that, uh, let's say, is new even in the, in, the technology, in the toxicology field. It's being used in, in the last 10 years or so. So we use here one class of models that are known as quantitative structure and activity relationship quasar models. And basically the intuition here is that these models are built on existing evidence, laboratory evidence, experimental evidence of the effects of chemical compounds on different types of so-called uh, toxicity endpoints. So different types of uh, um, human hazards or environmental hazards, let's, let's call it like that. And so these models are sort of, uh, either it can be artificial intelligence or, or regression models in a way that are built based on this evidence, uh, this existing evidence. And at the same time, they uh, basically look at, pre make prediction on the basis of the similarity of the chemical compound with those chemical compounds that are, whose effects are known, okay, because there has been prior research. And so it, and that's based on the idea that uh, in chemistry, which is a well established idea, that chemical structures that are similar uh, in their physiochemical and structural properties also are expected to have uh, similar effects. So these models essentially are uh, basically used, uh, and there are many models that can be used to test uh, uh, toxicity on humans and the natural environment. Each toxicity type is called as toxicity endpoint. So you can see the effects on fish or on uh, uh, different types of uh, humans uh, uh, functionalities. Uh, in particular, here we focus only on uh, uh, the most toxic category of the toxicity classes, which is known as CMR. So we look at carcinogenicity, mutagenicity, and reprotoxicity. So the interference with reproduction activities, because these are the most uh, worrisome uh, effects. Uh, they are not those dependent, so they are also something that is considered high. Um, problematic, uh, and there uh, is uh, clearly the, the, the most, uh, uh, let's say, the, the top uh, toxic category, uh, as defined by the European Union that has a regulation known as REACH regulation that is uh, allegedly among the most advanced uh, worldwide. We do this, and we do this analysis. Uh, actually, this is uh, again Gianluca uh, doing them manually one by one by picking up the chemical structures uh, of uh, uh, these compounds that are part of the patent claim that I explained before. We use a software developed by Instituto Mario Negri a, a within an EU framework project uh, that is known as Viga Ab, and we get a result which is similar to, I mean, which is like the one we see here, uh, which gives prediction uh, of reliability of the results and predicts uh, if a, uh, a chemical compound is toxic or not for that particular endpoint. So in this case, it's mutagenicity. 
um, we only use, uh, um, uh, we only consider a, a chemical compound to be uh, CMR toxic if uh, uh, the results are with high reliability. So we discard all uh, the uh, moderate reliability results, which means that we might be underestimating some of the effect, but we prefer so uh, rather than over uh, claiming our results essentially. So we are, act we are very conservative. Uh, these exercises are always cons uh, done consulting uh, uh, toxicologists, as I said before. So uh, once we have for each of these individual compounds uh, uh, information about how toxic they are, we aggregate this at the patent level. Uh, so uh, what we use here is a very simple uh, total count. So we just count the number of chemical compounds in the patent claim that are flagged as CMR toxic uh, uh, with high reliability. So going on to the results. Uh, so the first thing that we do is we look at the geography of pesticide indulgence. Let me say that because of data restrictions, we, we only focus on the period 1990, 2017. Um, there, are, there is some research that looks at uh, the evolution of the pesticide industry before that from the um, end of the 1800 to, um, to the 1980s. So it matches quite nicely with our work. And it shows uh, clearly that there has been, uh, there was life uh, before uh, in the 90s in terms of life for pesticides. Pesticides actually in the 60s, 50s, and also 70s have been a growing and high value generating industry. But the key message there was also that the key inventive countries were those with stronger chemical industry. So you name you know, the usual suspects are not just the US, but also Germany, Switzerland, and Japan. So at the early, in the early phase that we studied the period 1990 to, to 20, so the first cohort, we do have that, uh, um, you know, we do have confirmation about at least uh, three of the, the countries because the three, uh, the, the four top patenting, inventing countries uh, over that period are the US, Japan, China, third comes third. So you, you start seeing China and then Germany. And then over time, as we move forward, uh, clearly China takes, as you see from the graph, a more central stage. It becomes a more heavy uh, patenting entity or patenting country on pesticides, which also follows the, the path uh, and the pattern of many other uh, inventions in other industry. We know that China has caught up uh, not just on production grounds, but also on innovation grounds. And we also, China has had uh, important policies uh, in, uh, to foster um, patenting. And so that also explains why sometimes you see that, uh, that strong increase. But certainly China, we know the story, right? So, um, so because the key top patenting countries over this period that we analyze are China and the US, we decided to focus on those countries when we look at the intra-country uh, specialization. And so it was interesting that California, which is known for being the, high, the Silicon Valley or for being the high-tech hub of the, you know, the, the the coolest products uh, in the world is, is also uh, perhaps uh, a hub, uh, well, not perhaps, uh, according to our data, uh, a hub for inventions of uh, uh, pesticides. Uh, here you see uh, the big uh, companies, but also University of California. Uh, in um, being, Although we have to say that in, uh, in, in California, the, the concentration of uh, pesticides uh, invention is not in the hands of a few, it's quite dispersed because the first uh, five or four count for less, uh, for about 20%. So not very high. The concentrations of patenting is much higher in the case of Jiangsu, which is uh, uh, the province that we see has uh, uh, started uh, to specialize more over time in, uh, I don't see the, the evolution, I don't show you the evolution over time for simplicity, but basically, or Originally, in the early 90s, it was Beijing much more um, um, intensively pat patenting um, pesticides and uh, uh, Jiangsu uh, emerging later on and becoming clearly more dominant uh, over time. That's why I highlight that. Uh, and here, the concentration of patents is more, it's higher, it's, it's in the hands of, a, uh, you know, about 40% is in the hands of the top five and so on. 
So clearly, there's uh, there's two different specialization, and it's interesting to see that uh, uh, within a country, uh, perhaps in connections with uh, with other industries, or perhaps for for historical reasons, uh, there there is a specialization in this particular uh, industry. Um, and here is the temporal uh, patterns of these uh, patterns. As you see from on the left, you see California. This is the number of pesticide families. So it does not include uh, all the members of, uh, of the family. protection is sought in different countries. Uh, and you see that uh, in California, the pattern of uh, pesticide invention is rather stable over time. Um, whereas in, uh, um, in Jiangsu, it was uh, nearly non-existent in the in the 90s, and it started to increase from 2003, but really catching up quite massively in terms of numbers. Okay, so you, you see a catching up story there. Uh, you see the fact that, however, California is not uh, is not lost ground. The last year declines might be data issues. Uh, we're, we're still uh, checking on that. So uh, we also did this, the same exercise, but just focusing on pop pesticides. So at the national level, the story is very similar to the old pesticides in general. So you see this pattern shifting from Europe, US, Japan, to more to China. Uh, but at the same time, um, you have, uh, and also in terms of sector of regional specialization, you have, um, an increase in uh, a concentration in, in the same region. So you have an emergence of California also for uh, pop pesticides and you have uh, Jiangsu emerging as, uh, as the leading uh, uh, regions for, for pesticides and for pop pesticides. Now, pop pesticides are the dangerous, the most, the highly hazardous chemicals. So numbers are much lower because it means that you know, these are highly dangerous and many of them have been banned under uh, these treaties over time. All of them have been um, subject to, to international bans. Now, because of the regulatory fragmentation that I was discussing before, the fact that they are banned internationally doesn't mean that the countries are equally prompt and ready to enact uh, regional uh, lo uh, national legislation to, to enforce the ban, okay? So for instance, we have a patent application to the file to the US Patent Office by Syngenta in 2017, which is a mixture of uh, uh, pesticides, active ingredients, uh, which includes in the claim uh, organochlorine compound, including uh, um, those selected from the group consists of, uh, consisting of endosulfan, et cetera, et cetera, benzene, DDT. So these are all POPs. These are all persistent organic pollutants. So they are inventing something that is in fact um, subject to uh, an international ban. As you can see from the graphs down uh, in the in the last uh, in the in the bottom uh, right part of the slides, you uh, the, the numbers are jumping one year to the other. But mostly, what uh, we observe here is that California looks more um, intensively or more active in uh, uh, patenting uh, pop pesticides than uh, Jiangsu, both in terms of number. Uh, and also in terms of uh, um, presence over time of these uh, uh, pesticides. Um, the other thing that I have to say here is we are talking about number of families. So these, are, these numbers are likely to be higher if you look at also the total number of patents, uh, uh, given the fact that some families may be particularly big. And they are particularly big, as I will show you uh, later on in the case of US uh, companies. So now we move to the CMR toxicity. And so here again, we focus on a comparison between the region uh, in China and in the US in California, basically. And we look at the number, total number of uh, uh, CMR compounds uh, by region. So, CMR compounds is the number of uh, chemicals that are flagged as CMR, so either causing cancer, mutagenic, or reprotoxic, or the three of them um, within the pat in the patent claim. 
And that's, that's data by regions. And here you have the US on the right. And so you can see that there, there's, uh, there's some you know, there's some increase in some years and drops in others, but clearly uh, the number, the, the region that has more uh, CMR uh, chemicals in the patents is, is California and not China. And that you also see here when you also look not just at the priority application, so the first patent in the family, but also at all the patents in the family. So it inflates the value, but it shows that uh, clearly uh, the, if you look at the number of compounds that considering the, the whole lot of patents that are being uh, produced, uh, it clearly see, it, we clearly see a big, uh, so, a somewhat uh, significant uh, difference in some, of, in some of the years as well, in particular. So what we did, and we are still checking on this, uh, this analysis, this is just a, a sort of uh, essentially very descriptive analysis. Uh, here, what we do is um, we look at whether uh, the fact of being from California uh, and the fact of having a high number of uh, compounds uh, impact on, on the family, sorry, and, and the fact of in the number of uh, CMR compounds impact on the, on the family size. And so here you see uh, the interaction effect is positive. And what this graph shows essentially is that Californian uh, CMR compounds are part of bigger patent families. So that means that uh, uh, the, pa the patents that uh, are produced uh, uh, or uh, are filed from Californian in inventors um, are, uh, and that are, uh, C have CMR compounds in them are um, um, looking for, are protected in a higher number of legislation. So they are possibly going to be used in more countries. Whereas the Chinese case is that they have some less uh, CMR compounds and those that have patents that have CMR compounds are you know, um, more likely to be used for domestic purposes rather than uh, for a higher number of countries or uh, uh, because the, the, the legislation for which they are covered uh, uh, is not um, as high as the Californian uh, ones. So uh, what we, uh, just to sum up with, with some of these results, uh, um, first of all, the first uh, stylized fact is that the change in geography of pesticides inventions from the so-called triad countries, uh, US, Europe, and Japan to China is consistent very much with existing theories uh, and evidence on uh, product cycle, international division of innovative labor, but also the pollution have an hypothesis. So we are moving towards China uh, as we are in terms of pesticides, as we are with other um, products um, however, we have um, we have a different story to tell here when we look at the at the toxicity. Uh, first of all, because more more uh, you know the, the most toxic inventions are not from China. So one always think about China and to blame uh, China or other countries that have uh, possessed less legitimacy for being the most polluters. So the, where the problem now stands, because all the advanced countries have become frontier, they're green, they're working on uh, you know, cleaning and uh, the environment and so on. And instead here, we don't find that. We find the opposite. We find that in fact, California retains uh, uh, leadership in highly toxic pesticides but also that uh, IPR appropriation strategies of Californian invented patents is uh, in a bigger set of jurisdictions. So they, they're globalizing hazards in a way uh, by staying if, in California in terms of uh, by retaining in California their skills on uh, highly toxic um, chemicals. Whereas it seems that Chinese inventions are more for domestic use uh, and as, which is opposed to US inventions being for more global use. So clearly that has, uh, could have implications that I think are interesting to understand the geography of dark innovations and, the, and that agenda. Uh, if we think about dark innovations as pesticides, um, um, we, we see from this study that um, there is a change in geography, but at the same time, uh, there's not a change in geography in where the hazardous or the dark innovations uh, are produced. And so 
So that also uh, casts doubt on the capacity of uh, being able as a, uh, to, to slow down the processes of uh, the achievement of sustainability goals and to ensure a toxic free environment. Because if the leading uh, countries uh, worldwide where we expect to have the cleanest, uh, I mean, we don't expect that if we are like, we, we might not expect that, but the discourse and the narrative is that these are leading uh, actors and, and the others are laggards and the others are where the dirty stuff happens. Well, actually, we don't have that story. Uh, we have the opposite story. So clearly there are many uh, other steps and then a number of caveats that, that I, I don't think I have time but, uh, to, to discuss, but that I can elaborate on that on the Q&As. But um, so what, what next step that could be interesting is to see how dark innovations go together, you know, if they go together with green innovations, because one expectation could be that they do more of both. Um, and that's not necessarily that green innovations or green chemistry is going to replace dark chemistry, as I, as I call it now. I mean, it's, it's possible that they serve different purposes. And so they go in parallel. And if they go in parallel, we have a decoupling of, uh, um, of, of this uh, of talk and action in a way. And we and that's that's a problem. If if you assess and if you look at the from the perspective of a, what what we think should be a responsible capitalistic system. Um, also, we 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 haven't done the step from patents to products. It, it may well be that these products that these inventions ever never come to light in terms of the products. They don't get authorized. Um, although, again, for the uh, story of, his, of institutional fragmentation, uh, well, there, there can be chances that they manage to get authorized in different jurisdictions. Uh, we have also to consider, and this comes from some of the insights we got from interviewing uh, people in, uh, in different, uh, in some of the interviewing um, managers in some of the uh, chemical, big, big chemical companies that sometimes they offer greener products to the poorer countries, but they cannot afford uh, buying them. And so they prefer to have, you know, sub versions of DDT or DDT related toxic uh, chemicals uh, rather than buying perhaps a brand new uh, chemical that is less toxic uh, because the prices are just not for them. And so, and what companies do in these cases is just to sell them the toxic one and to train them how to best use those chemicals. But of course, some of these chemicals, as I said, are persistent. So it's not that if you use safely, you probably are less exposed yourself, but you will get them back through 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 the food, for instance, and so so this training part is is a little bit dubious. Um, how much effective it will be to uh, address um, the the problems of sustainability that we have, and um, and also one of the key uh, questions that we have, we are working, uh, we're trying to to work with uh, with uh, some colleagues at Bocconi, uh, is why firms uh, patent dark chemistry sometimes. They patent things, including chemical compounds that are banned. And this is a big puzzle, also because we see an increase in these patents, not a decrease over time. Uh, one of the possibilities is that companies are still exploiting that knowledge that they have accumulated over time to sell those chemical products to, to poorer countries. Um, which is the pollution heaven hypothesis, um, and they they play with uh, with the exemptions and you know the different uh, uh, imperfections of the regulatory system at international levels. And clearly, that's that's also another problem because some of these chemicals are a global concern, as I was saying before. Um, just to mention just an anecdotal uh, significant trait of the, some of these chemicals, especially persistent organic pollutants, is that you can find them in the Arctic, uh, because even though in the Arctic, of course, they have never been used. And so now with the melting of the Arctic ice due to climate change, a lot of these uh, substances that were perhaps massively used in the 60s, that have been trapped in the Arctic ice are re volatilizing. Uh, uh, because of uh, the climate change. Uh, and the fact that they are in the Arctic, really, it's what shows that they are 
everywhere and that they can very much travel long distances. And for this reason, they represent a global concern. So I'm not very positive of, uh, of perhaps of what is going uh, to happen. The final note that I want to make is that clearly the chemical industry knows that uh, pesticides are a technology that is necessarily uh, going to be phased out. Uh, the reason why um, Bayer bought Monsanto is precisely because Monsanto is stopped in, gene, in genes and in uh, genetic uh, engineering of seeds. And so one direction where uh, the chemical industry is moving is trying to develop uh, seeds that don't get sick so that you can, uh, well, just put it in a simple form uh, so that you can use less and less pesticides over time because they clearly know that this is a major liability that they have. And so perhaps that's what's going to uh, save us in a way from, from massive use of pesticides. Um, although we, we, we don't know how long it will take. Uh, and so in the meantime, we're, we're still subject to this, to exposure to these uh, kind of toxicants. Okay, I will stop here. I don't see your face, so I I'm, 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 I'm still I'm there. there. I mean, I'm still here. I should also be visible. Uh, Elisa, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for your, for your presentation and for having drawn our attention on this dark side of innovation, which is still not yet well known. So we are all used to things that, that innovation and patents are good things because they contribute to well-being society. But you rightly point to the fact that there's some dark side of a story. And, and so we thank you for having attracted our attention to that. Um, I hope you don't mind me taking the opportunity to say that we will have the pleasure to welcome Elisa again here at the virtual GSSI premises because uh, early May, the 3rd and 4th of May, we're going to host here at GSSI with the contribution of the Regional Science Association International a workshop uh, on, on regency between the green and, and the digital transition and, and Elisa will be uh, a, a, a keynote speaker uh, together with Lars Koenen. Uh, so the, the, the call for this workshop is an early career workshop. It's open to young career PhD students willing to have um, feedbacks on their research proposals. So uh, I see that we have also some colleagues of our PhD committee that Simona here has also run. So please help me to diffuse the call of this workshop uh, uh, because it's very much related to this, to this, okay? So sorry for this adverse. So now get back to Elisa talk. Um, now we have this uh, recent uh, routine or, or uh, practice to uh, open the discussion, uh, given priority to PhD students. Uh, the uh, greatest part of, of our attendees are uh, PhD students of ours. So, we usually uh, leave them, you know, to break the ice if they have questions, curiosity or whatsoever. And then eventually uh, we open the floor also to, to faculty members and to external attendees. So if, if there are questions from uh, PhD students, uh, please don't get shy and go ahead. Any question? I have a question. So oh, I'm... that's Francesco Lelli. Francesco, please go ahead. Thank you for this opportunity and thank you, Elisa, for the interesting contribution. I have a question. Uh, did you consider uh, some intrinsic dichotomy between dark innovation and green innovation? For instance, University of California made a lot of patent, a lot of dark patent, but uh, what is the amount of green patent from University of California. So if there is a, a ratio, a sort of ratio, thank you. Yes, okay, so, so thank you. I, I, let me say, uh, as I said at the end, um, we have not um, looked at green innovations or green inventions in the pesticide industry. One reason, and perhaps you can help, is that, I mean, you in the sense of general audience here, uh, we are still uh, trying to identify how to code, uh, how to identify green patents uh, in, the, in, the, in the pesticide and chemical industry. 
Uh, one easy way is to look at if they sell, if they are coded in the data sets as, as, as green. Um, but we, we were like doubting that this is enough. So we have started to uh, work on that, but it, we have not gone very far. I don't know if then uh, Ariana want to say something on that. The second point here is, the, is another issue that we have not uh, treated in this particular paper, which is the fact that some of these patents we are focusing here on patents that use uh, these chemicals in the compounds, but there are also patents that are meant to clean the effects of these uh, uh, dirty, let's say, or, or toxic uh, pesticides uh, um, from the environment. So what we call cleaning patents. Uh, we have done something, uh, some research to look at that. Um, in many cases, we don't find that the, the, the firms or the countries investing a lot in cleaning are the same that invest a lot in the dirty ones. For instance, uh, Japan is very strong in cleaning because they had uh, one big accident uh, uh, back in time. I don't remember exactly the year. And, uh, and from there, they have become very much alert about uh, especially persistent organic pollutants. They have had... Uh, um, an agenda on that. And so you see that. But the, otherwise, it's not that they go together. However, that's interesting, because I think if they go together, um, and, and if the green doesn't green the dark, uh, I think that's interesting in terms of understanding how capitalism work. It has broader, to me, it has a lot of broader insights. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. To make an exception to the rules of priority based students because Simona has to go. So, and, and she has a couple of questions. So please students, apologies for that. Simona, please go ahead. <laughs> sorry, yes, Sandra, sorry, but I have also a PhD oh, meeting no, now, sorry. so I have to go. Um, first of all, I wanted to congratulate Elisa, Arianna, Gianluca because this is a fantastic uh, paper. And I have uh, two questions. I mean, it's it's striking how in parallel we go, and uh, how this California story is, uh, you know, geographically, it, it, California absorbed the dark side of innovation because we, in the parallel work we're doing on conflict mineral again, the hotspot is there. So my husband is from California; it's very critical. In fact. Um, Two points, just uh, you talk a lot, obviously, about this big hop spot. Um, I I would like a couple of words on the maybe the sub hot spot in Europe. I mean, what what is the position geographically of European regions? If you have for sure some evidence, and the second point is. Um, this substitution process, right, the, the dark towards the green looking at patents, since we are thinking about precisely doing the same thing, do you have any idea? I mean, we can share that, but how to measure the substitution towards, you know, better technologies, greener technologies through patents? Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, that's funny that... Uh, <laughs> And also it's funny because uh, California has been portrayed by in our field as uh, the real model. It probably on many issues it is, uh, but uh, certainly has a big dark side. So, uh, we need to account for, I think even in theorizing. Um, so uh, regions in Europe, yes, in the original uh, analysis we did, we included Germany because Germany has uh, still uh, some work done. Actually it has a regional specialization. I didn't show the map because eventually to do the toxicity analysis, we had to restrict the sample. It's too time consuming. And so we skip Europe on the grounds that US and China were the dominant players. But um, definitely there is things go there are things going on in Germany and in one specific region in particular. I don't know if Ariana wants to say something because she I remember she did uh, the, the first uh, maps uh, a couple of months ago, and then we decided to go for another strategy for the paper. And, uh, and on the, on the substitution effect, we haven't yet discussed that. Ariana, again, if you want to intervene after me, it's um, because as I was saying before, we are still trying to figure out how to measure the green innovation in this industry. And so once we haven't, well, once we've done so, we will try to find out by looking at, you know, yeah, to, to find some indicators of, uh, of substitution of one against the other 
One thing could be, but I, I might be completely wrong, to look at the similarities in the structural properties of the molecules and if uh, if some that are you know belonging to the same typology of uh, chemical uh, subs or, or if there is some radical innovation, I don't know. I mean, the short answer is that I don't know. I, I leave the the, the, the word to, to um, Ariana. Perhaps she she can say more. Yeah. Okay. No, thank you. No. No. Uh, talking about Germany, I was looking back at the first maps we we did, and yes, I mean we there was like a hot spot starting in uh, uh, Westphalia. But then we see that over time, also Bavaria and uh, oh my God, wait, sorry, because I'm uh, and also Baden-Württemberg is uh, can becoming uh, like uh, so to the south part of Germany. Also, they are increasing. Uh, this is in relation to the uh, pesticides. And of course, yes. At the beginning, uh, we included, of course, Germany because of the tradition of chemical industry and and, and so on. But as uh, uh, Elisa said, I mean, we have to uh, focus more in, for use the toxicity. As regarding the measuring substitution effect, I mean, I have to admit that I don't know uh, so clearly right now. Of course, because if you think about substitution, you should think about maybe more products. Uh, and of course, there is like, because I mean, you want a product, you know, want, you want to find the pesticide uh, that is maybe, you know, a, a substitute to a pesticide that maybe is less toxic or even it's a green chemistry. So it's like uh, meant also to maybe not only to work as a pesticide, but also to clean a bit. And uh, so there is the, and the link between patents and products or application is um, not that easy to uh, to spot. Maybe text analysis or this type of techniques can help a bit, but I have to admit I don't have like a straightforward answer to say yes, so you do with citations or, um, or, or, or something like that. Uh, maybe, you know, you can use uh, some IPC classes to identify maybe some application, and, but then uh, maybe to find that maybe within the same technological classes you have like uh, greener, but for instance, if you look at like this uh, classification of green patents are mostly based on IPC classes. So you, you identify already classes that either green or dark. So uh, so basically I, I don't have an answer for that. Of course, it would be great to find no, <laughs> Let's share it with me because we do also text. And I mean, let's share because we are yeah. working on different yeah. things but the yeah. methodology. Okay, yes. thank you. Well, yes, but I think that uh, maybe it's something that is feasible, maybe for some subset in which also you have some data product. Mm -hmm. So maybe, you know, you have, the, the, because especially for very regulated uh, um, sector, maybe like pesticides, it, maybe it's easier, to, it's easier to find, you know, registered products, you find the compounds. And then, so of course it's a lot of work, but I think it's, it's <coughs> maybe feasible when you have some kind of meaningful links between maybe compound patents and product, something like that. That's um, Thanks. great seminar. Bye-bye, <laughs> everybody. Thank you, Simona. Bye-bye. See you soon then. Yeah, bye-bye. Okay. Ciao. Ciao, and Simona. Thank you. Ariana, your hand was due to this response or do you want to intervene? No, okay, good. Yes, yes, because I was called in. So. Yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> uh, so, and I'm, I've, I've collected a uh, sort of couple of questions from our faculty, but before moving to them, again, uh, students, do you have any other question, curiosity, or other kind of uh, issue you want to raise to, to Elisa? Okay, we might then uh, return. Aldo, does yeah. the, the, Andrea Bertin. Oh, there's uh, Andrea and Francesca. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't see who, who raised the end first. Uh, maybe Francesca and then Andrea? Okay. Um, actually, she raised the hand. If Andrea wants to go first. Okay, Andrea then. You are muted, Andrea. And by the way, Francesca, we can't hear you very well. Sorry. I the same. Andrea, go ahead. OK. Well, uh, thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. Um, I was thinking, because you mentioned the case of Monsanto, and I was thinking in the link with Bayer. Uh, so if you see something between the, the link between the pharmaceutical industry, because in some cases seems that they produce the pesticide and then they sell also the drugs. <laughs> um, and also uh, regarding the le legislation, I know that it's very different in different countries, but if after applying uh, um, 
uh, the legislation, I don't know, maybe uh, organic farming law or something like that, if the discipline, this law changed something. Uh, I mean, if the law act as a disincentive to, to produce this type of innovation. Thank you. Okay, so we haven't looked at the connection between the chemicals and the pharmaceuticals also because these are two different industries uh, um, and also differently regulated and, and that would be a completely diff also new uh, work. I mean, I, th I think it's interesting also to, to look at whether there are spillovers uh, between the two. Uh, and in terms of uh, assessing policy impact. Okay, so um, we have, uh, not looked specifically uh, here in the on on that so on the assessment of policy impact this is certainly one exercise that we can do or could do we, there are some caveats because uh, very often the policy impact uh, address you know targets uh, all the firms so you have a treatment that is uh, across uh, countries or within uh, an individual country. So it's very hard to find a counterfactual or a, a group uh, of firms that is non-treated uh, unless you look in other countries where there's no regulation. So, I mean, it, it's certainly an interesting idea. And then we have um, uh, looked uh, at some of the, uh, at least uh, in a descriptive fashion, at whether the Stockholm Convention has had any impact in terms of reducing uh, inventing uh, inventions on uh, some of the persistent organic pollutants. Um, the results are not very much encouraging. In fact, we, we do find the counterintuitive uh, results, but we haven't looked at any national uh, specific regulation and whether that has impacted or not what is going on. But that's certainly one, one, one direction we could take. Good. Then, then Francesca. Um, can you hear me better now? Yeah, definitely better. Okay. So my question is uh, unfortunately related to the previous uh, three questions, and it's again on the green dark. So even if we don't have data yet on, on the green uh, patterns, um, because uh, the first thought is uh, maybe it's a diversification strategy, no? So in terms of product and of risk as well for the firms. So I was i uh, wondering if you have some data on the size of the firm that are producing dark, uh, most dark patterns, in the sense that maybe we can expect that the uh, biggest mm, corporation do this diversification strategy more than smaller ones. So maybe if we, if we knew that uh, most uh, dark patterns are from bigger firms or something like that, we can expect that it's a diversification strategy and maybe we can um, no, infer that smaller uh, firms are instead uh, going towards more green uh, patenting. Yes, so that's a great intuition. We, this is something we we are working actually on uh, 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 as one of the potential uh, um, interpretations of why firms patent dark uh, chemistry. Um, we're not necessarily, it's not just a matter of size, it's a matter of uh, diversification. And as you said, and so uh, we think that there is something that has to do with the fact that uh, the more you can uh, uh, diversify, um, um, you know, the diversification could impact the strategy. However, in the direction in which it can impact, it's, it's a big question mark because on the one hand, one can think that if you are more diver diversified, you have many markets, you can uh, more easily and more promptly um, abandon uh, um, dark uh, innovations because uh, you simply have other alternatives going on and you don't need to, uh, to get the risk of continuing in a, in a, in a track that is not uh, sustainable. Uh, but on the other, you could still uh, have uh, the opposite uh, prediction that uh, actually, because you're safe on the other uh, on the other domains, you could still uh, uh, have uh, motivations to to persist doing uh, pesticides that it can be toxic because you know that you can exploit until the end and you are not losing anything because you're still investing in another direction. So when the end will come. You will just have a second, uh, a second, a second best plan. Whereas if you don't have a second uh, best plan, uh, you you basically uh, go bankrupt. And so it's not immediate what the prediction could be. And this is one direction where we we are going. In fact, so very good uh, suggestion. Uh, 
I mean, <laughs> at least in terms of what we have come up so far. Good. Okay, thank you. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. So any other question for PhD students, then we uh, don't, don't be shy. So feel free to raise any kind of curiosity you have. No, no other question? Uh, by the way, Elisa, you might have seen that Ron has had to go. Uh, he said that he was a great talk and he sent you his best regards to you. It's too generous with, <laughs> with me. Uh, it was kind to having here. Uh, yeah. Right, so while we're waiting for other questions from VH students, I think that Alessandra was one of the first that actually uh, asked you to intervene. So please, Alessandra. No, I mean, mine are a mixture of curiosity, suggestion, I don't know, I just have three. One is on the dark patenting. So I'm always, when you say, well, we don't know about something, I'm always trying to think, oh, why would I do something like that? And here's my question. On the reason why these uh, firms are patenting things that are obviously toxic, uh, dark, and they cannot use it. I was wondering, and I don't know the answer, maybe we should ask a chemist. Uh, has it ever happened that something that was uh, cancerogenic uh, could be slightly modified, the chemical structure or whatever, to actually become usable and less cancerogenic? I don't know, because if that's the case, maybe they want to uh, kind of, you know, put a flag on something that at the moment uh, is very cancerogenic because they think that that could be a start for something that it's less cancerogenic or less harmful. And I don't know the answer, but I was thinking maybe that's why they do it. I was trying to find some kind of rationale for doing something like that. Um, and then, okay, so one of the things that struck me the most, being Italian and very concerned about, uh, uh, no, very concerned not, but really, you know, you think about toxic things. So the first thing you look at, it's uh, the color of Italy. And by the way, thank you, because for a second, we didn't think about the virus. Now we are all worried about uh, cancer and all other stuff that comes from this. Uh, uh, so it was a, a good distraction. Um, so the, I said that from the beginning, it was going to be the best. Yeah, but we didn't think about uh, COVID for a second. So that was good. Uh, OK, so looking at that map, Italy obviously was very red. Yeah. So the first thing I thought, because I'm always trying to be optimistic and positive, is actually we, we are one of the countries with the highest uh, average uh, uh, life expectancy. And so I'm thinking, is it because we are particularly resilient, not even pesticides kill us, which is probably unlikely, or is it because maybe in Italy we are using these pesticides in this quantity more recently so what's the dynamic because if we were not using them before then of course my grandpa lived to be 100 because he didn't have any in his system but now i'm full of pesticides in my system so probably i won't lead to 100 so i was just wondering about the dynamic if you could see that in some countries this went particularly worse while in other you know it, it was kind of stable whether it was good or bad but it was always uh, the same. And of course, I would like for you to tell me that it has always been like this. So we are particularly resilient to this. And then the last thing you mentioned this, obviously, you're looking at who is producing it. But uh, I always say that uh, I'm more worried about this goes as a lifestyle principle. I'm always more worried about the enablers rather than the people that do something bad. I believe that people do something bad because other people are enabling them or even giving them incentive to do this. So are you planning in the future maybe to look at, I don't know, some cases of big companies in California or in China and look at whom they are exporting to? Is it Italy that buys all their products? Is it, I mean, because it's the, it's the demand side that causes the damage to the people and that enables them to supply so much of these uh, uh, bad uh, chemical pesticides, uh, you know, dark innovation. But great presentation, thank you. So yes, uh, great comments. Uh, thank you, Alessandra. Um, Okay, so the first question is, um, again, the short answer is, I don't know, but it's not that I don't know, but uh, normally, uh, um, so we have 
one of the uh, evolutions of this project should be to, to use uh, uh, one methodology that allows us to track the similarity of, of chemical co structural, of structural properties of chemical compounds over time, as to see how they evolve, if they evolve incrementally, as you said, for instance, uh, we change one bit. They, of course, there is a, an evolution that can be incremental because so you, can, you can simply change one uh, connection in a chemical compound and patent as new or they are more radical innovations. Now, in uh, what we know before the 90s is that a lot of the radical innovations occurring in the chemical industry appeared in the early 60s and 70s. Um, we haven't done now this exercise, but we have been discussing and setting up the methodology for looking at this evolution. And once we know what is incremental and what is radical, uh, we can also assess the differences in toxicity. With the caveat, however, is that uh, what we use in terms of toxicity analysis is that if the chemical structure is similar, we are going to have similar predictions in terms of toxicity. So in chemistry, in principle, if you just modify a small bit of a formula that is a CMR, it's unlikely that you have a, a non-CMR. Uh, what we could perhaps find is that for a certain degree of similarity, but not very high similarity where you have a jump, then you can have which, which jump could be used. You could um, could use knowledge in the earlier from the earlier structural properties, uh, and that jump is a radical innovation which is less toxic than uh, than is you know would give credit to your uh, to your uh, to your comp, I mean to your theory. And I, I think that uh, that's certainly one direction uh, we we are going. We have been discussing to take. Of course, it's extremely time consuming to count. Uh, to do this analysis, but this is one of the things that we would like to do. So that's uh, that's well taken. On the on, on the Italian thing, I have to say I went uh, I jumped on the Faustat website. Uh, Faustat has this data from 1990, so I cannot go back really to our childhood. But from 1990 already we were very red, and that also is owing to the fact that we have. Uh, a very high densely populated country. So that there might be heterogeneity of spring within the country. I'm sure there is, uh, but uh, given the amount of land uh, uh, and the amount of uh, the, 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 some, the very high density uh, of uh, population, then perhaps that's why also it explains this very high um, level of, uh, of so we are genetically modified and very resilient even to pesticides that's why we <laughs> last <laughs> long <laughs> actually i think in veneto there has been a big discussion about the emergence of a number of illnesses due to exposure to pesticide spraying and other things so um, also we have to say that italy but that's not perhaps not connected to toxic chemicals italy is one of those countries in europe with the highest levels of premature deaths so that also needs to be played, uh, uh, taken into account. But yeah, maybe we are resistant. I don't know. Uh, I don't have a. I don't have a, a, an answer to, to why we're we're having so much sprayed and yet. Even Italy was also one place where uh, DDT was sprayed massively during um, uh, the 30s because of the malaria, and so we had uh, been exposed to to that too. Um, the demand side is also an interesting part. We, we are looking at who buys and who sells. We, we are not looking at trade. We have looked at some false statistics trade. We, there is one interesting uh, reportage done by Greenpeace uh, and uh, Public Eye where they show how much the EU, for instance, sorry, the UK is a major exporter of uh, pesticides, also banned pesticides to many developing countries. So there is a demand and the demand is uh, generally elsewhere Europe. Um, also, we have to say that Europe and, and US are, are regulated in a slightly different uh, way, despite being uh, tightly regulated and perhaps started to regulate pesticides before uh, other places in the world. Um, the, the approach is very different. I think the rich regulation in Europe is the best one worldwide. I mean, this is by many accounts that uh, is very stringent. So you should be happy 
that we have that we have this and actually this is also interesting that the reach regulation now uh it has a very very stringent protocol for authorizing new molecules and where and they also are reassessing the old ones cutting down a lot of the uh i don't remember exact percentages uh, they came up in an interview uh, recently, uh, some 30% perhaps of the uh, older uh, uh, the, 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 the chemical compounds that are now used throughout Europe uh, are no longer reauthorized. So that means we are using things that are not reauthorized. And that's for the, for the chemical principles, for the, for the chemical sus substances. Now for the products, then there is national authorities which authorize them. Uh, and they are also different because uh, as far as we can understand, Italy uh, is different from France or from Spain because we put focus on different issues of safety. Also based on uh, the country's citizens' uh, uh, demands because if there is no interest uh, uh, of course for instance in Tuscany we have banned gly glyphosate uh, one week ago uh, I'm not sure how many other uh, uh, regions in, in, in Italy have, have banned uh, glyphosate but at the same time six or seven months ago there, were, there was a vote against establishing buffer zones between the fields and the schools or the civil uh, or the houses uh, when uh, there was a uh, pesticide spraying, which is uh, something sensible because the, the, the buffer zone can help, uh, you know, reducing the impact. That was, we voted against. So there is a lot of uh, incoherence in, in how we, and we also, and it was always a uh, center left government, although the, the, the governor changed, it was still same party. So, uh, so that you know, I detoured a little bit, but essentially we we have um, we have a stringent regulation, but we don't have uh, the demand is global. I would say of these substances, as an, as I was saying before, the poorer countries are keen on accepting, they very still keen on accepting dangerous pesticides. So we have that problem. I mean, I think. Right. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Elisa. Then uh, I pick up a question from Alberto and then Adriana. Alberto Marzucchi, please go ahead. Thanks, Sandro. Uh, can, you, can you hear me, Elisa? Yes. Uh, great presentation. Thanks a lot. Uh, I have a series of comments um, on, on your work. Uh, the, I mean, I think this has been picked up already in other, in other previous comments, but I, I feel that the way in which you treat policy regulation is a little bit, uh, allow me to say, a little bit disappointing in a sense, because this is probably the most regulated sector in, you know, in the industry at the moment, especially you mentioned it, the reach uh, regulation is so strong. It's the strongest environmental potential regulation in, in Europe, and yet in your picture, is a little bit uh, blurry the role of regulation. Um, and I, I mean, I was expecting to see what is the role of regulation uh, and what is the difference in, the, in this particular sector compared to other sectors uh, due to the role of regulation in your first next steps point uh, in your last slide, to be, to be, to be honest with you. Um, because I think it's super interesting, in fact. I mean, you've got a super stringent regulation um, uh, potentially too much in some cases, uh, which though uh, is not inducing uh, as we would expect. I mean, you've, you've got the traditional inducement uh, theory, uh, hypothesis, sorry, and then uh, yet you see um, such a sort of still, uh, you know, uh, dark side of the story going on. So it's kind of interesting. I mean, that angle is particularly interesting, I think, as a contribution to the literature, because it would, uh, it would actually tell us that the uh, policy inducement hypothesis doesn't work so well in this particular case. And I think it's a very interesting angle. The second comment I have uh, it is, is about, uh, again, uh, the, the role of regulation. Uh, sorry for that, but okay. I mean the, the, the story is is is, is intriguing, uh, and uh, but uh, the regulation is about uh, production and use uh, rather than invention. Um, and I appreciate that in your next steps you're talking about what is what is the what, what's happening within firms and so on. 
um, which is very challenging. And uh, I would suggest potentially uh, as, a, as a way out uh, that you can add to this paper to see uh, what happens within sectors. So uh, creating a link between patents and, and sectors using the, the, the super used uh, Liebert and Zola's uh, paper, for instance. Um, so for instance, uh, there may be still a lot of invention in the dark side, but the, the, the industrial dynamics of those sectors that are patenting in, uh, still uh, on this dark side is, uh, is particularly negative. For instance. That, could be, uh, that could be another interesting angle for me that would go in the direction of the production side. Um, and the last one is about, uh, uh, um, again, the role of the dark, uh, the sort of brown uh, chemicals. Uh, and to me, uh, this is not counterintuitive, but to me, the fact that there is a sort of complementarity, if you want, between dark and green um, is in fact expected. We know that green technologies are kind of recent. And so given the cumulative, cumulativeness of the technological change, um, I would have expected that uh, Together with green inventions, you still observe uh, dark ones because at the end of the day, from an invention point of view, from a knowledge, you know, uh, production point of view, in order to produce something which is environmentally sustainable, you need knowledge inputs that come from, or knowledge experience, or technological experience, name it as you want, okay? don't, 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 don't take me, I mean, I'm using a bad terminology potentially, but, but inputs that uh, experience, that capabilities that, uh, uh, being developed in the dark era. And that to me is particularly consistent with what you observe. Yeah, okay. So thanks for these comments. I think, I think they're very useful. On, on the regulation, you're right. In, in another um, work that we are doing, we, we, are, we have tried to look at whether there was an impact of uh, the Stockholm Convention ratification um, on, um, on the inventions. And also comparing again, and that we can compare with comparing with uh, with uh, with a sample of pesticides that are not subject to the convention, that have characteristics that are similar in terms of other observable elements. Uh, we have done an initial exercise on that. Arianna is uh, if she's around; she will uh, remember that we have. Uh, we, we we actually find this result that uh, the um, Stockholm Convention is not effective at least in uh, reducing uh, uh, inventions again, because uh, of course it's not on, uh, on inventions, it's on product, but we, 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 we know from the chemical industry that uh, the rate of inventions, the rate of products uh, go in the same direction. Of, of course, the scale is different, okay? Um, and so, um, so that's definitely one issue we, we, we again, uh, we, we stopped a little bit about that because we, we didn't know how, uh, how to explain that, the fact that it doesn't have any effect. So that's why we started thinking about perhaps we should look more at the firm strategies to understand the mechanisms of why they do this, uh, because this could help us explain the counterintuitive results of the lack of uh, functioning of the policy. So we have left that on hold. Uh, and so if you're interested, we, we, can, we can catch up on that, because if you have insights, uh, uh, that can also help us to, to, to bring this uh, again running, uh, that's, uh, that's certainly um, useful. On the reach, again, we haven't done anything on the reach specifically, although we could try to do that because the reach is 2006, so we have enough time uh, for observing something. And, uh, and in fact, this is a good idea. Um, we, we would have to look more at the European context, I would say, or, uh, but also companies that have operations in Europe, uh, even if they are foreign. So, so that's, uh, that's certainly something that, uh, as I said, we have started doing and then we, we, we weren't uh, very, uh, you know, satisfied with, with the interpretations. And so we put that uh, for further thinking on, uh, on the product use. I mean, if, we, if you have in, in again, I, I'm not sure I fully understood what you said, but if you are, have suggestion about how to, we could match this data on patents with products, 
Uh, we, this is also something that Diana has been looking at for some time. I'm not sure where she's, uh, she's gone <laughs> in terms of how far she's gone. No, no, I know you're there, but I don't know if you have uh, done any progress. And, um, and on the relationship between da da brown or, or dark and, and green, yeah, I think this, this idea of looking at both, which is again, something we have not yet done because we, we are not sure how to code green. Uh, could also actually uh, be very interesting if we could look at whether the green one build on the dark or not. Uh, if the dark in a way provides, because for instance, if there is incrementality in the innovation, then you would expect that they, they build on the, their own past dark. Uh, if, the, if it's completely radical, perhaps they, as it, it is with genes, Bayer acquired Monsanto because they are not strong in genes. So that's completely a new jump into a different field. And so rather than building on the old technology, they just bought a company with an R&D lab that had that skills. Um, the other thing is uh, that I'm intrigued by is whether the fact that you go green means that you are how long does it take for you to abandon dark? And how long does it take that? Uh, for me, it's important because the more you, it takes to you, the more it means you are likely to bring to the market stuff that is toxic for many people. And so, and you are exploiting that to the very, you know, they're very late, come on, because they know about these issues uh, for 40 or 50 years. So it's not that you just realize that there is toxicity. And so they have, they are yeah, really stretching the business as much as they can. And it's incredible that they're not just stretching the business product wise, they're stretching the business also by building new uh, IPR appropriation strategies, uh, which means that, you know, it's not just, okay, I sell over and over the same compound. Uh, I also build new compounds. Uh, if I can add one, uh, one super quick point on that, yeah. I mean, I think that is the most interesting part of the story because there's been a lot of discussion on the anticipation, for instance, of regulation. So you know that by the end of next year, there's a strict regulation, so you start to innovate now, but the delay uh, that you're focusing on, it's, it's never been explored. So how long does it take to get rid completely of the browns? I mean, you know that you start a little bit in advance with the green, but we don't know for how long we stick with the brown. And that's, I think, the interesting bit. Uh, for, uh, for a scholar, at least like me, who's interested in environmental innovation. Okay, good. I mean, I think that's a super interesting suggestion. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. Then, then I think that Adriana Pinate, who is a postdoc scholar here at GSSI, please, Adriana. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, thank you, Professor, for your presentation. It was very, very interesting. I really enjoy it. And I don't know if this was someone say or you already say, but it's more like uh, while, I, while you was presenting, I was thinking on some different things that I don't know if you already have seen or, uh, or there's any logic. <laughs> but for example, I was thinking on transgenic cops. You know, there is the genetic, the genetical modified organisms and their patenting of them. And there is uh, demonstrated that, uh, well, in the United States, uh, I love documentaries, so I saw this. So in the United States, the transgenic cop are the regularity. So they are sexual uh, done for a law to avoid that they um, reproduce alone. So this is a, a normal thing that is behind. So there is, you know, big stuff that they don't want uh, the liberty because they have a big pharmacy and stuff like that. Genetical modified organisms, they need more pesticides. So perhaps there is a, a enormous correlation um, of these two variables and there is patenting of this type of GMS. And uh, the other thing is that the intensity of the consumption of the land as the climate change, how much this affect the use, the necessity, I'm talking about the pesticide particularly, and perhaps um, a variable, it could be the dimension of the whole of the company of um, agriculture. Uh, for example, as Sandra was saying, like in Italy, the difference between the United States, 
I think that one of the reasons too is that in Italy, there is not the law of these transgenic crops. And at the same time, the, the agriculture is, is more little for dimension. And Eurostat gives you, in fact, the, uh, the dimension of the, farm, of the farms here in Europe for the holder. So there are, uh, in Italy, uh, there are particular little ones, for example. So perhaps more little is your land, less pesticides you need. In fact, there is a nice documentary on that in the United States. It's the biggest little farm. He, he doesn't use pesticides for, and it's an amazing because it's enormous. Uh, it's so difficult because there is a lot of climate change and the farm cannot be so big. So I don't know if there is a, any correlation you have seen on that, and particularly for the genetic modified organisms and the necessity of this pesticide because it's like a Perhaps there is a dualism between the two of them. And thank you so much. I really enjoyed. So I think um, perhaps I can say thank you for the, for these uh, um, insights. Uh, so one one thing is that the the, the, the transgenic uh, crops and the transgenic seeds. So it's true that there are countries that allow for that and that have uh, uh, to, when they are grown in intensive agriculture, and it's all often the case, they also are uh, coupled with one uh, specific product. So Roundup, uh, uh, the glyphosate is connected with a specific, specific uh, GMO seed. Um, what I have um, discussed with, uh, for instance, BASF, is that it is one of these big chemical uh, companies is that they are not necessarily uh, going into GMOs uh, because for instance, they know that in Europe there is a strong aversion towards GMOs. And so they are, they are interested in genetic engineering, but uh, sorry, not in genetic engineering, in, in the, the genetical refinement of seeds through hybrid uh, um, methodologies. I'm not an expert, but basically it's not that you're engineering the seed, but you're just mixing different seeds DNAs in order for them to improve their qualities as it has been done already for many uh, centuries when you, when you think about the seeds. So they, they are more into that and they have it clear that even, and that's why, because they also think that the, the, the only herbicide or chemical that you associate with the GMO, rather than you have the heavy many, it, you just need one, uh, is not a solution to the toxicity problem, precisely because also these uh, chemicals that you associate with the genes of uh, genetically modified seed, um, it's, it's toxic. And so that's why they, they, want, they, they want to invest more in this technology in order I don't know whether this is feasible, this is not for me to say, to have seeds that, that need over time less and less uh, pesticides uh, or herbicides or any associated product with these genetically modified things. I don't know, this is the direction, one of the directions they are taking together with uh, precision farming that is basically trying to use ICT technologies to just establish small spots where you can spray pesticides rather than a generalized spraying. Uh, and, and so they have it clear that they need to phase out that. Um, otherwise, uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't have uh, the information that you were su suggesting about uh, the, um, uh, you know, what we know clearly is that uh, uh, genetically modified seeds uh, and, and production of genetically modified crops it's generally in, especially large countries, Brazil, uh, United States, uh, uh, Argentina, just to mention a few, are clearly intensive agriculture. And Italy is a different uh, situation. We don't have this uh, size in terms of intensive agriculture. We do have, no, nevertheless, agriculture. We do have use of pesticides, even, for instance, in the wine industry, which is quite big in, in Italy, uh, we have uh, use of pesticides. Uh, and so even if it's smaller lots, that doesn't mean that they don't use them. In fact, according to Faustat, they, we do have pretty much a heavy load of, uh, and I think ISPRA as well has uh, interesting statistics about that. I don't know if I fully answered. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you, yes. Okay, thank you. I think that Darianna raised her hand. Darianna, do you wanna say something, please? 
Uh, no, yes, it was just a quick reaction also to some to Alberto's comments and also like also because Elisa. No, but because I think there is, I mean, I, I, really, I, I think you're right on the point of regulations and maybe we should ex study more. But I, my, we started first to be interested in being interested in seeing what is the effect of the Stockholm Convention. So that was banning these uh, pers um, persistent organic pollutant. But what we found, for instance, was that the toxicity of these patents related were increasing over time. So even after the ban. And then, uh, I mean, what striking me was that we went to ask uh, to chemical, I mean, colleagues uh, here at the university, of Pisa, and what they were telling us, okay, that basically we're not that surprised that the ban was actually not working because, or at least was maybe, you know, we, we didn't have the DDT, but still you have something as toxic probably as the DDT or even more toxic, maybe not persistent, but it was that basically, you know, companies, I mean, the ban is very specific on a compound and then companies simply do an inventing around that doesn't have anything to do with green uh, uh, inventing around uh, or so on. So I think there are two histories in terms of cumulativeness. I mean, I fully understand, you know, company, I mean, they cannot, I mean, you, you maybe you were used to do uh, brown chemistry and you built on that. But on the other hand, I have, I have the impression that at least for this ban, uh, uh, there is also a story that is less, uh, I mean, it's more like a company has built these plants uh, that are specific for producing certain compounds, certain pesticides. So they want just to change very small things in the, uh, in the overall compounds that is, that is not banned, but basically is a kind of the same product overall. And this I mean, so is something we were working on to try to, to see if there is a possibility to also study similarities in terms of compound because, and so you, you really see that, uh, uh, so it's not just a norm, I may say, honest story of cumulativeness, but there is a, something more on firms' uh, behavior strategies and be more, you know, invest, in, you know, you have invested in production and, and then, so on the contrary, I agree with you that rich is another maybe type of story because also when we spoke, I mean, Elisa mentioned it. I mean, rich is much more stringent. And my impression when we spoke with some expert working in a chemical company were telling us, I mean, this fact of the 30% of their products wouldn't be allowed anymore. And, for, and there you see that there is a change of strategy. I mean, the, 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 the guy was telling us that my impression is that, okay, they're moving. I mean, they're not doing pesticide chemical pesticide almost anymore. I mean, they will continue as long as they can, but they know they have kind of changed completely the paradigm. So, and so, so I think there are two issues, but then of course we need to see how to measure this new green uh, chemistry or even, you know, this hybridization of seeds uh, because basically they are going to there. And, this, and the, as she was, uh, Elisa was saying, we, we are trying to identify these green uh, chemistry patterns because from what I saw in these classifications uh, that there exists, there is not the category. I saw in a very old uh, research policy paper that is working, that uh, they have this classification and so on. So we are working also on that because, of course, we would like to see if firms, uh, so there is a kind of substitution. So, I mean, maybe not as strict as um, um, Simona was suggesting earlier, but maybe, you know, you can see if there is, uh, you know, within pesticides and so on, you know, more transition within the firm. Uh, of more green uh, chemistry or something like that. That of course you would expect, especially at least in Europe, at least what we, our evidence more qualitative as also Lisa was saying is that there is uh, that. Then of course the rest of the world and this company are selling also, uh, you know, they're selling developing countries and we're telling us, okay, we don't change our product uh, in developing countries. If there we can sell there, we sell the, the product that is banned. Maybe we teach them how to use it. Maybe we give them a little mask so they can try to protect themselves. But basically, I mean, they give us a bit this uh, sort of view. I mean, where there is the rich, uh, we follow the rich. Where there is not, uh, we kind of continue with our, our own business. So, okay. So I think it's interesting, these things. And, but of course, we need more, more data and... <laughs> And so on, but I think, of course, it's if we want to, uh, it, it would be interesting to look at more the effects of uh, uh, specific regulations. Also, because we have also, uh, I mean, variations in the, in the world in how the, there is the the application of this regulation and the enforcement. So, okay, so then, okay, it was just my <laughs> comment. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Thank you Ariana. 
Right. Uh, I don't know whether uh, there are other questions. I, I forgot to ask to Chiara Burlina if we have questions from YouTube. I don't think so, right? No, unfortunately, no question from YouTube. So, I mean, we're approaching the end of the webinar, but I, I would have, uh, not, really, not really a question, but maybe a comment. I don't know what it is. Uh, I was really fascinated by the toxic toxicity analysis of the patterns. Uh, it's really a terrific exercise, as you said, of multidisciplinarity, working with people in other fields. It's just really uh, fascinating. Um, and, and that kind of analysis, uh, I mean, recalled to me immediately the idea of the quality of patterns, right? So there's a sort of alternative quality of patterns. And I'm wondering what happens if we try to put the two together. So. In, in, this might be a case in which uh, having a high quality pattern might be a wrong thing uh, with respect to high, to high toxical patterns, you know? Because, uh, I mean, the quality patterns are those patterns that spread around, that they are cited, that, that have knowledge spillovers. I'm wondering uh, whether in this case it might be uh, a good news having a low quality kind of pattern. And I mean, more in general, uh, reflecting on the relationship between our usual uh, knowledge-based uh, uh, index indicator of quality and this kind of, of quality indicator would be an interesting thing to think about. Uh, the second uh, thing that I thought about uh, is uh, how to position this idea uh, of the toxicity of patterns and the evolutionary economic geography story, right? Where we all know that uh, regions are expected to progress their knowledge to diversify it according to the famous relatedness principle, right? So they go ahead being related to what they already uh, do and to their existing knowledge base. Here again, I'm wondering, um, it could be interesting to see the, the kind of relatedness of these toxical patterns to, to which uh, so, sort of uh, um, uh, knowledge uh, fields they are close to. Because this might be a case, again, in which uh, working with relatedness might not be a good thing. Uh, and in this case, uh, being unrelated to these kind of patterns might be, might be better. So in general, I know these are really rough intuitions and I'm not so sure whether I've been clear enough, but, but I think that, that, we're, that focusing on the toxicity of patterns and relating them to other uh, usual notions that we have and we control, you can look at the very interesting things. But this is not really a question, it's, it's just, just a comment. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, even. <laughs> no, no, I mean they're, they're very to the point. I mean, I, I, I agree. Um, um, some of the perhaps I should situate also that, that this project is uh, uh, we're just coming up with the, with the first uh, couple of papers uh, of a project that we have been actually Gianluca uh, and Arianna. So together, and Gianluca has done a lot of uh, data work. I don't know he's uh, uh, without camera. <laughs> but um, a work that has lasted some three years now. So, so we, we are uh, also selecting the directions uh, for, for paper. We, I think I could say we are also open for collaborative ideas. Uh, um, so feel free to reach us if you have a clear idea what you want to do and uh, we can match, we can put our expertise or a part of our data that can be useful, we can be matched with other data sets that you have. And so I think that's certainly a possible avenue because clearly the three of us, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, it takes time to do a lot of the things that uh, we, we mentioned today. And so we are prioritizing on, on a, we are building step by step. Now this paper came because it's, uh, it's a paper that came out of, uh, of this GeoInno special session and the idea of having a sort of special issue uh, in regional studies so that we, we had to think about something um, for that particular package. But, uh, and then we, as I said before, we were working with, uh, with people, um, with another group on the, on the strategy part. Uh, but certainly we are open and, and, I, and I agree that uh, 
the, I've always been puzzled by the, the relatedness thing, and it would be nice to see yeah. uh, to see that. But we we, we couldn't add this uh, to this paper because it would have been too perhaps too laborious or um, and on the on the quality, yes. I mean, it's would be nice to to check that. We discussed with Ariana some time ago. About I might have a question instead rather than the comments that I should yeah. post at the beginning. Uh, and about the motivation of doing this uh, toxicity analysis. Um, I, I'm on, the, the question is, um, in, in your narrative, uh, is, isn't the number of patents in pesticides, the number of feminine pests in pop already a dark side story? Or does it become dark when you look at toxicity? Well, let's say that uh, pesticides are a potentially dark innovation, as I said, they can potentially harm. Uh, and the toxicity is a finer, is a more fine grained uh, assessment of that uh, potentiality, because of course toxicity varies across pesticides. They're not all equally uh, toxic. Some are acute toxicity, but not chronic toxicity. Others are more toxic for certain uh, animal species, but not for humans. So that diversity, now I focus on, C we focus here on CMR, but you can, you can test any, there are some 50. Uh, is, is it my problem or did, did, can you hear? No, Elisa, we lost you. I'm yes, sorry. yes, because my, uh, the, not, the, the um, internet connection here, despite being at the, my office, it's not working well. Uh, Okay. Um, we lost some yeah. minutes or so. Yes, I mean, we, there are nearly 50 toxicity endpoints that we could look at. We focus on just three that, that are among the most important, together with another couple. And, and, uh, and so, yes, you can look at that variation too. Uh, you can have uh, products that are very low, to low toxicity too. So that's not necessary that all pesticides are dark. Okay. Okay. Or they are dark to a different extent. Let's put it like low dark, <laughs> light gray from. <laughs> Red. Okay. So there's some bright part of the story in pesticides too. Okay. Or not really bright, not, not dark. Let's put it that way. Okay. Thank you. So any other question from, from the floor? Otherwise, I think that we, yeah, we have actually reached the maximum time available, so it's nearly 12. So uh, I think that uh, we uh, should and could stop here. Uh, we really thank you, uh, Elisa and, and Coulters, for uh, this interesting webinar. Uh, it was really interesting and uh, I will possibly get in touch with you for future ideas. Um, I don't know what I, I uh, might do the same. Uh, so yeah, I stop here. I remind to everybody that we're going to have uh, another webinar on when, next Wednesday uh, before the Easter break. We're going to have uh, Tatiana De Rugina talking about pollution. So still in the dark side of <laughs> not really innovation this time, so but connected to this. And I hope you to see you as numerous as you were today. I wish to everybody uh, a good prosecution of a day. And thank you very much. Ciao. Thank, thank you. Bye, Lisa. Bye. Ciao. Thank you. Bye. Ciao. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.